reach for the stars, reach for the paracetamol, many films and TV shows have headache-inducing propulsion systems which just largely ignore the laws of physics. The basic problem is the stars are very far away. Most of our familiar stars will take millions of years to reach even at the fastest speeds our conventional rockets can manage. It gets worse. Albert Einstein realised the speed of light was an absolute constraint. No object can travel faster than the speed of light or even get anywhere near it. Essentially, it's a problem of kinetic energy. Old physics textbooks talked about the confusing concept of inertia, the property of mass to resist change. However, at relativistic speeds, it becomes a useful idea. The greater the kinetic energy of the spaceship, the harder it becomes to push faster. This requires more powerful and heavier engines requiring more heavy fuel. This downward spiral of thrust versus inertia leads to an absurd situation of engines of infinite power pushing a ship of infinite inertia at the speed of light. Even if this were possible, it would still take decades to get anywhere useful, although the perceived journey time for the astronauts would be fairly short due to the relativistic time contraction. One solution is to place the astronauts in suspended animation for a long, slow journey. Suspended animation machines are a widely used staple in science fiction stories, but in fact they probably wouldn't work. The film Passengers imaginatively uses the idea of a machine failure as a plot device, but various other concepts in the film make little sense. So, how do we speed things up a bit? Since the 1930s, science fiction writers have used the idea suggested by the general theory of relativity and later string theory to find shortcuts through higher dimensions. Most famously, Isaac Asimov used a hyperatomic drive to power the ships of the Galactic Empire through hyperspace in the Foundation series of stories. I'm greatly puzzled as to why it took 80 years for it to appear as a TV series, and the writers have had to deviate from the original source material rather a lot. However, the ship's propulsion system remains faithful to the original idea without explaining how it actually works. Another related idea is the manipulation of gravity. Star Trek's warp drive allows ships to bend space-time. This is achieved by an antimatter reaction generating power to create a region of distorted space around the ship which resembles the distorted space-time in a relativistic flight. A lovely idea, but unfortunately this wouldn't actually make the ship go faster than the light. If the Starship Enterprise were to actually do this, then the view out of the window would look decidedly odd. The original series just ignores this idea and just has stars trundling by. In reality, the distortion would redshift all the stars behind the ship into the far radio frequencies and squash the stars in front into the gamma ray parts of the spectrum. Time would, in theory, travel backwards, horribly violating the laws of thermodynamics. Arguably, this is beside the point of Gene Roddenberry's original idea of an optimistic future in which faster than light travel is a vehicle to encounter philosophically challenging life forms and societies. Likewise, Star Wars. John Williams' stirring score with the now iconic elements of lightsabers, Darth Vader and R2-D2. In many ways, Star Wars is actually a World War II movie in disguise with a few sword fights chucked in for good measure. The final chapter of the first 1977 film is loosely based on the Dam Busters, a 1955 film based on an actual bombing raid in 1943. However, the film raises a number of questions. What are the bright lights at the back of spaceships? What is a proton torpedo? Does it use the strong nuclear force to hold it together? Why does Luke keep forgetting how to use his Jedi powers? Why do the Rebel Alliance commanders have sore throat lozenges sewn to their uniforms? The science of Star Wars should be taken with a heavy dose of salt. I assume the Rebel and Imperial fighters use some sort of gravitational manipulation. This would presumably distort space-time to create a gravity well into which the spacecraft can fall towards accelerating as it goes. Exactly how this works is unclear. Perhaps the transmission of generated gravitons projected ahead of the fighter via quantum foam wormholes, or perhaps some other ungainly method of distortion. It would, however, make close formation flying hazardous. Things start falling apart rather rapidly if we take a detailed look at the attack on the Death Star. Using some reasonable estimates of the size and mass, we can calculate some basic details. However, running these numbers through the standard spaceflight equations, we arrive at a rather surprising figure for the speed of the X-Wing fighters in the trench, a little over the maximum speed limit on UK motorways of 70 miles an hour. Any faster than this, and they will be flung out into a higher orbit and out of the trench. This is the sort of thing that happens when the details haven't been thought through terribly well. If the X-Wings are reliant on the Death Star's artificial gravity, then this should be fairly easy to mess up the attack by switching it off. 
Gravitational manipulation would enable the fighter to manoeuvre very easily, and this would have exactly the same behaviour as rocket engines. Defending TIE fighters would have to angle their flight path and decelerate to pop down directly behind them, otherwise they would be flung out in turn. As for the X-Wing fighters banking and diving, this makes about as much sense as this animation would for a Bomber Command movie. The glowing lights at the back of the spaceships is another great puzzle. When I first saw the film in 1978, I assumed they were some sort of rocket engine. However, constant acceleration in one direction would lead to all manner of problems. So, what are they? Heat exchangers? That would sort of make sense as engine grills on tanks are at the back away from the enemy. Another variation on gravitational distortion is the creation of wormholes. A wormhole is a theoretical tunnel of space-time to allow instantaneous travel. We don't really know whether they exist or can be constructed, but modern concepts of quantum physics allow for the existence of quantum foam, a nanoscopically holy fabric of space-time. Theoretical concepts including building Casimir effect electromagnetic plates using dark energy, or plotting a path through M-theory folded dimensions. Wormholes are used to good effect in Foundation 2001 and Interstellar. These use a shallow angle wormhole where space-time is curved gently to avoid an abrupt cliff edge of relativistic time distortion. However, instantaneous travel tends to be a plot killer. There is much greater anticipation of future events if the vehicle takes time to reach its destination. Jumping a spacecraft through higher dimensions is all very well, but what if you could cut out the middleman and build the entire ship in n-dimensional space and create a small movable doorway in regular space? Such a spacecraft was improbably designed by a BBC committee for a children's television programme in 1963. The Doctor's randomly materialising TARDIS appears hilariously as a 1960s police telephone box in all manner of alien locations, a concept arising from budget constraints rather than from a holistic design concept. Most of these methods of propulsion are theoretically vaguely plausible. However, the prize for preposterous propulsion, the most utterly ridiculous mode of travel, goes to the spore drive of the USS Discovery, in the Star Trek spin-off of the same name. While the series is well written and well acted, with an excellent cast, the starship could traverse intragalactic fungal hyphae using a vastly enlarged tardigrade. This concept can only be described as... In many ways, this is similar to Douglas Adams' bistromatic drive. This is a refinement of the infinite improbability drive in which robots argue over restaurant bills to generate the improbable numbers required to instantly propel a spaceship. Adams' creation is obviously in jest, but I'm not really sure how serious the writers of Star Trek were being here. The less you say about how starship propulsion works, the more likely it is to be plausible, a sort of Heisenberg uncertainty principle. The more detailed an explanation, the more absurd the engine becomes. However, it's always easy to criticise, less easy to invent new stuff. Most of these methods are highly imaginative and deserve credit for sheer ingenuity. Thanks for watching. Long live bonkers starship engines.